In some states, there have been laws passed giving mothers the joint right with the father in the guardianship of the children. But 20 years ago, when our women's rights movement began, by the laws in all of the states, the father had the sole custody and control of the children. It didn't matter even if he were a brutal, drunken man of loose morals. He had the legal right, without the mother's consent, to apprentice her sons to rum sellers or her daughters to brothel keepers if he so chose. He could even will away an unborn child to some other person than the mother. And in many states, this law still exists, and the mothers are utterly powerless. Is the denial by law of the ownership of one's own person, wages, property, children, the denial of their right as an individual to sue and be sued and to testify in the courts, not a condition of servitude most bitter and absolute, even though it is called by the sacred name of marriage? By these examples, we see that all married women, wives and widows, by the laws of these states, can be technically included in the 15th Amendment when it specifies a condition of servitude, either present or previous. And not only married women, but I will also prove to you that the entire womanhood of the nation is in a condition of servitude, as surely as were our revolutionary fathers when they rebelled against old King George. Women are taxed without representation, governed without their consent, tried, convicted, and punished without a jury of their peers. And is all this tyranny any less humiliating and degrading to women under our democratic Republican government today than it was to men under the rule of England 100 years ago? In the words of Thomas Paine, that great revolutionary patriot, the right of voting for representatives is the primary right by which other rights are protected. To take away this right is to reduce man to a state of slavery. For slavery consists in being subject to the will of another, and he that has not a vote in the election of representatives is in this case. The proposal, therefore, to take away the vote from any class of men is as criminal as the proposal to take away property. Is there anything further I need to say to prove women's condition of servitude to be sufficiently established to give her the right to the promises of the 15th Amendment? Will any man disagree with me that to talk of freedom without having the vote is mockery, even slavery? to the women of this republic in the same way that New England's great speaker Wendell Phillips declared it to be for the newly emancipated black men at the end of the late war. The Declaration of the Independence of the United States Constitution, the constitutions of the states, and the laws of the territories all alike propose to protect the people in the exercise of their God-given rights. Not one of them pretends to give these rights themselves. All men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these, the governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. In these sentences from our Declaration of Independence, we see no shadow of government authority over our rights, nor any exclusion of anyone from their full and equal enjoyment. This document pronounces the right of all men, and consequently, as the Quaker preacher said, of all women, to a voice in the government. And here, in this very first paragraph of the Declaration, is the declaration of the natural right of all to vote. For how can the consent of the governed be given if the vote is denied? The declaration also states, 
that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute a new government laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its power in such forms as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Surely the right of the whole people to vote is clearly implied here. For no matter how destructive to their happiness this government might become, anyone who is not allowed to vote could neither alter nor abolish it nor institute a new one except by using the brute force method of insurrection and rebellion. One half of the people of this nation today are utterly powerless to remove from the law books any unjust law or to write there a new and a just one. The women, dissatisfied as they are with this form of government that enforces taxation without representation, that compels them to obey laws to which they have never given their consent, that imprisons and hangs them without a trial by a jury of their peers, that robs them in marriage of the custody of their own persons, wages, and children, are this half of the people who are wholly left at the mercy of the other half. This is in direct violation of the spirit and letter of the laws set down by those who established our government. Each of these laws was based on the unconditional principle of equal rights to all. The preamble of the federal constitution says, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. It says, we the people, not we the white male citizens, nor even we the male citizens, but we, the whole people who formed this union. And we formed it not to give the blessings of liberty, but to secure or safeguard, safe keep them. Not to the half of ourselves and to the half of our posterity, but to the whole people women as well as men. And it is downright mockery to talk to women of their enjoyment of the blessings of liberty while they are denied the use of the only means of protecting them that is provided by this democratic republican government, the ballot box. Clearly then, there is no constitutional grounds for the exclusion of women from the ballot box. No barriers whatsoever stand between women and the exercise of their right to vote except for those of precedent and prejudice. I appeal to women everywhere to exercise their too long neglected citizens' right to vote. Join me this November 1872 at the ballot box where we can fight our battle for the ballot peaceably and persistently until we have complete triumph when all United States citizens, both men and women, shall be recognized as equals before the law. Thank you.